Hey yo, Wastelanders, how's it going? Gonna say right out of the gate that this is one of my favorite runs I've ever done, and here's to hoping it lives up to my claim. Fallout 3 as an NCR Trooper was a real good time. If you've been a fan of the channel for a while, you know the general gist and a reminder that it was you who voted for this. Great choice, in my opinion. For those of you who are here for the first time, first off, welcome to the channel. It's great to have you here. That said, here's a little rundown of the rules. In combat, we can only use what's available to an NCR Trooper. On screen now is the inventory. We have quite a bit at our disposal here. Our NCR Trooper armor isn't amazing, but all those weapons? Yeah, I think we can work with this. Any quests that I do which require an item, I am allowed to use those items for the sake of clearing the quest. I do like to do Moira Brown's Wasteland Survival Guide, so in that instance, for example, I am allowed to make use of the Repelled Mole Stick. And whether you're new or an ongoing fan, there's one more stipulation that we'll be adding to any and all Fallout 3 challenges going forward, starting with this one. You guys voted not unanimously for obtaining the bobbleheads pertaining to our tag skills. Speaking of which... So we're going for small guns, melee, and explosives. I know where the first two are, though I haven't been to the National Guard Depot in forever, so it should be fun. I remember that place being pretty hard. Uh, going into this playthrough, I don't remember where the explosives are, so that should be fun. Last but certainly not least, we start with the special allocation that our unit and or character has. In the NCR Trooper's case, five across the face? Honestly, this is pretty sweet. Always like a run where I have at least four intelligence because educated and comprehension are excellent perks. Between comprehension and TTW's version of the intelligence bobblehead, which is located in Dr. Lee's lab, so we'll always grab it. Use of a skill magazine gives us a whopping plus 25 temporarily to that respective skill. TTW and bobbleheads are just swell like that. And now before we set the scene for our NCR Trooper, just a reminder that this is the last TTW-based Fallout 3 challenge, at least for a little while. Going forward, our Fallout 3 challenges are going to be coming from the vanilla game, but we will, of course, keep to our new requirements of having to obtain our tag skill-based bobbleheads. And with all of that out of the way, let's set the scene for how our dear lady arrived here in the Capital Wasteland. As Fallout 3 takes place four years before Fallout New Vegas, we can still work with some of the ongoings in the Mojave Wasteland. The NCR had been there for some time, battling the Legion, leading up to the climactic clash at Hoover Dam, a battle that resulted in the former's victory. I believe that during the events of this challenge, the Battle of Hoover Dam would actually be going on right now, as our NCR Trooper is not there to partake. You see, the average NCR Trooper has about two weeks of training after conscription and before being sent to the Mojave, like its procedure, as Chief Hanlon says. Many NCR Troopers meet their ends at the hand of a zealous legionary, their moral and efficiency the complete opposite of the often amateur conscripts. So what does she do, and how does she get here? Well, simply put, she deserted. She and four others head out in Union Station and manage to get the train to work before they were brought in for their desertion. You could say that she and the rest of the squad are sort of like the misfits, but rather than being lazy, they just ran away. Of course, they went from the frying pan straight into the fire. After the two weeks it took to reach Union Station in DC, they were welcomed by a group of super mutants, the ones who have been holed up at the entrance. Two died, leaving three to navigate this hostile new world. Our NCR Trooper is the only survivor, having lost the last of her companions near the end of Farragut Metro Tunnels to a power of raiders. Having escaped with her life, she's able to convince Grandma Sparkle to let her stay for the night. Though Granny doesn't quite have room for her, so she does have to sleep outside. Thankfully, the lurks ain't got her. Since then, she's made her way to Megaton, omitting the whole desertion thing and being from well over 2,000 miles to the west. She's also racked with the guilt of having lost her four squad mates, as well as the whole, you know, desertion thing. But her bit of experience is just enough for her to be welcomed in as an extra pair of hands and a decent shot at Megaton. She also apparently has a way with words, as the shady Mr. Burke has left and no longer has the intention of detonating the bomb. She chooses to keep that information to herself, lest the revelation causes chaos and panic. Besides, she defused the bomb. All's well, ends well. As for the Lone Wanderer, at this time they're dead, having been killed during the events of the escape quest. Now, speaking of Vault 101, the Medicine Bobblehead is located in there. You can find it on James's desk before leaving, or when returning to Vault 101 later. But since I loaded a save right at the exit of Vault 101, I had already gotten it. Boone and Raul had it as well. 
I haven't visited Vault 101 in any of these runs because, canonically, neither Boon, Raul, nor NCR Trooper have had any reason to do so. They've had no interaction with Vault 101, and with such limited time with James, a no real connection is developed, and as far as James knows, his son slash daughter is doing just fine. <laughs> yeah, about that. If by doing well you mean serving as adequate fertilizer, then yeah, sure, I guess. But hey, who knows, maybe in one of these runs we will go back and change Vault 101's fate, for better or worse. I guess time will tell. Oh, and Nephi was there, but since we played it up like part of his origin story was that he was the Lone Wanderer just for laughs, he kind of killed everybody at the start, so Driver Nephi also didn't return there. Our NCR Trooper may have deserted, but perhaps she can make the Capital Wasteland a better place, regain some of that gusto that she never had. Now, speaking of the Mojave Wasteland, we're about to have a run-in with a familiar faction here. And something I was actually worried about going into this challenge is that Sarah Lyons and the Brotherhood of Steel here in the Capital Wasteland, their power armor does count as faction armor, which is a Fallout New Vegas mechanic. But as you can see, we're not counted as hostile, thankfully. I actually like that quite a bit, it is very lore-friendly. I like to imagine that a lone deserting NCR trooper is all sorts of bamboozled seeing an entirely different Brotherhood of Steel chapter here. And I mean, hey, she might be NCR, but there's only one of her, and these guys haven't shot her on sight yet, because that's what the Brotherhood out west would certainly do right now. For the time being, best to play ball, and who knows, maybe there's a reason why these guys are out here and are a little different from the Brotherhood she's heard about. I like to think that our NCR trooper has never actually faced the Brotherhood of Steel before. Everything is fine and dandy, up until at GNR, the Super Mutant Behemoth busts out and starts wreaking havoc. While he is very powerful, fortunately for us, he's also very big, so it's really easy to trick his AI. We go, we fall back a bit. He runs away after he's either killed or knocked everybody else out, because of course he will. And we just keep chipping away at him. And with help from the Brotherhood, this fight isn't too bad. See, here in a casual playthrough, you're meant to pick up the Fat Man and take him out in two shots. But we can't use the Fat Man because it's not in our inventory. That's kind of good though, because the ammo is weighing us down, being that this is hardcore mode. This is a great spot for us to clean up our inventory as far as that goes. I always thought it was funny that despite the fact that this dude is carrying a giant lead pipe and a makeshift shield, he has all sorts of really interesting loot on him like pulse grenades, missiles, sometimes he has an AR ammo to go with it, stuff like that. And yeah, we could let the Brotherhood just kill this guy, which they do right here, but it's always fun to participate a little bit. Now, as for our NCR Troopers' involvement in the main story, I'm thinking that this time around, even though the GNR radio signal is weak, she is able to receive it, and she's motivated to fight the good fight. She's one of those people who are inspired by Three Dogs' words, and since the Lone Wanderer never made it out, and James didn't help Three Dog because James is kind of a cheapskate like that, we're gonna go ahead and participate in the good fight. And in order for that positive message to be spread, we have to go grab a radar dish, Install it, and that way, GNR signal can be broadcast throughout the entire wasteland. Sounds like fun. Let's go do it. Now, to get there, we have to go through several metro tunnels. That's usually pretty easy, so we're gonna cut straight to the building where we have to get this radar dish. Also, got some stuff to sell, so if you'll excuse me. Oh, and as we enter, one more thing I forgot to mention at the start of the run here. I actually forgot to put this little rule in my script is that because we are canonically playing as a character that shouldn't have a pit boy outside of its uses for inventory, like it's effectively our knapsack, our storage. I don't use vats, I don't use our flashlight. I got this idea from a fan and honestly it sounded really fun. Now I love vats and I'm not great at shooting, so it makes the challenge just a little bit more interesting for me. Now the first two super mutants here are nothing to worry about. And because this is always somebody's first video, and maybe people who are watching aren't aware of this, I'm gonna go ahead and show you where to get a free stealth boy here that you can get right at the entrance. With the first two super mutants dead, it's safe to grab this. It's always here. There's actually a fair bit of stealth boys that you can get throughout the course of the game. Not randomly generated, they're always scripted at their locations. Now, I mentioned at the start of the video that we have a wide variety of weapons at our disposal here. And it's here, and many other times throughout the run, where this comes in real clutch. Anytime we have a melee weapon to deal with stragglers, like the guy we're hacking to pieces. 
It's always nice to save ammo, and the combat knife in particular is a decent melee weapon. Swings very fast, it's strong for the early game. This place isn't too bad to clear out, and with the Virgo 2 communications dish in our possession, all I do is set that bad boy up, go back to 3 dog, and we're good to go for advancing in the main story. The next part of fighting the good fight is to locate that James guy who came here not too long ago. 3 dog seems to like him for some reason, so we can track him down at Rivet City, as that's where he was last seen. Before that, however, we're gonna go get the first of our three required bobbleheads, the Small Guns Bobblehead, located at the National Guard Depot. Now, like I said, I haven't been here in a long time, and this place is really difficult from what I remember. And, I mean, the beginning is not too bad outside in the entrance, where there's just a couple of army protectrons. Our sniper rifle is able to make super quick work of them. The interior of this place is pretty difficult, as there's a lot of strong robots inside, ranging from Sentry Bots, Mr. Gutsies, there are other Protectrons inside as well. I always thought that the National Guard Armory was one of the most well-designed dungeons in the entire game. Now, the Depot is divided into multiple sectors. The Armory is where we want to go, because the Armory is where the Guns Bobblehead is, and in Tale of Two Wastelands, it's called Guns Bobblehead, because New Vegas merged big and small guns together. But normally, it's the small guns bobblehead that's located here, and that's what counts as our guns. I'm going with that because the weapons at our disposal, yeah, we don't have anything that would be classified as a big gun. Not only has it been a while since I've been here, I actually don't remember what the Tale of Two Wastelands version of the small guns bobblehead does, so I'm real excited to see it. And as you can tell by our limb damage, we are just having the best time here. The Mr. Gutsies are real dangerous with their plasma shots. And we're in such poor condition, even the Protectorons can do quite a bit of damage to us. The NCR Trooper armor isn't great to begin with, and our NCR Trooper helmet is also not great for defense, but eh, it's what we got. And as if the robots weren't hard enough, the Mark VI turrets, even the Mark III turrets are real dangerous for us, again with our poor condition. And our armor rapidly deteriorating throughout the course of this dungeon, They do it does quite a bit of damage to us. Best thing to do in this case is equip a decent weapon and bank around the corner, hoping to heck we can pot shot it before we get taken out. And now here in a sec, you're gonna see me switch over to the police pistol. We are allowed to use that because that is a 357 Magnum, and 357 Magnums are part of our arsenal. We are allowed to use any variant of the weapons available to us. It's always nice to find this weapon because you get the police pistol and dead money. Finding it outside of that DLC, and especially in Fallout 3, it's always a nice treat. Wait, can I use the 357? Hold on, I, I gotta punch up our inventory one more time. Nope, sure can't. 357 is not on our inventory. Well, I guess I failed this run. Oh well, I'm gonna keep playing though, because honestly, I'm having a blast. And everybody knows that I could have blown up that turret with any of my other weapons anyway. And now, thankfully, I don't have to open that door, the one with the terminal to the right of it. Yeah, you open that door normally by getting all five of the Keller family transcripts. I believe there's a password that unlocks that. It's been a while. I just remember needing the transcripts for it. And there being a pretty sweet weapon in there, as well as a glowing one. Thankfully, we don't have to. But that doesn't stop me from taking forever to find this small guns bobblehead. Having gone through this place and spent about two hours in here because I hadn't been here for a while, navigating it. While fun, did take quite a bit out of me, that's also why I mistakenly used the police pistol when I wasn't supposed to. But fear not, we do get our bobblehead, and it gives us 5% additional damage with our firearms, ballistic based. That's pretty awesome. We'll go ahead and show you our limb damage. When I say we got messed up here, I mean it. Now, let me show you a fun little trick in case you ever fast travel to Megaton and Doc Church's clinic is closed, as long as you've completed a certain portion of Moira Brown's Wasteland Survival Guide, you'll have the Rad Regeneration perk, so all you gotta do is go down there, drink the nasty bomb water till you have advanced radiation, and your limbs will automatically heal over time. And now, Three Dog wants us to go find James, and that's all well and good, but I feel like we should spread the good fight to other regions of the Capital Wasteland, and you know what better place to spread that to than Big Town, a place that is in dire need of help. Now, this place was pretty challenging when we came here as Raul, and judging by how this battle with these super mutants goes, I'm gonna say that this is gonna be a lot easier with our NCR trooper, because we don't have a jumpsuit for protection. Now, here at Germantown Police Headquarters, we'll be fighting some upgraded super mutants, 
And that's really good for us because not only is experience points great, but we're about to get a significant upgrade to our arsenal here. The service rifle and the 10mm pistol were excellent up until this point. But now it's time to bust out our little friend, the assault carbine. Yes, I can actually use that weapon. And already we can see heck of a difference. I mean, that super mutant, psh, go through it like paper. And now, having access to the assault carbine, which uses 5mm ammo... That's gonna make me shack up with Protector Kasten in this run. Gonna be awesome being able to get 5mm ammo just by turning in some energy weapons. We can't use any energy weapons anyway. Not only that, but sometimes Super Mutant Masters here in Tale of Two Wastelands will be carrying Assault Carbines, which means that we can also keep our gun in decent condition while getting extra ammo off of them. I feel like this is gonna be our real breadwinner this run. And I was expecting the Assault Carbine to be good, but thanks to this weapon, we straight up bulldozed Germantown Police Headquarters. So we're gonna go ahead, save Red, all that good stuff, and just like as Raul, we're gonna defend Big Town. Gotta spread the message of the good fight, you know? Now, there are a variety of ways in which we can help Big Town defend itself, and it just so happens that guns is one of our tag skills. So, we're gonna go ahead and use our 50-plus gun skill to teach the residents of Big Town how to better use their firearms, firing, cleaning, etc. And with their assistance, the super means that invade the waves of 2H are super easy. It also helps that we have a sniper rifle and the element of surprise. Now, something pretty funny happens with the last super mutant. Like, you can see him go for his grenade and he wants to throw it. But he, he keeps going between us and the residents of Big Town, so I don't think he ended up actually throwing it because, I mean, it's in his inventory. Maybe he had a second one and I just didn't see it go off. And we can head back to Red for a job well done. Fortunately for us, not only is Red a doctor so we can get healing, but she's also a vendor and has caps to barter with. I think the only one in the game who isn't consistently a vendor is Doc Banfield down at Tenpenny Tower because, like, sometimes he has merchandise to sell and caps to barter with, and other times he doesn't. And honestly, we're gonna need to prep up as much as possible because what comes next? Uh, we're gonna need a little bit of firepower, a little bit of healing, all that good stuff. Because we're gonna go ahead and clear out Paradise Falls early. Now, if only I could get into a decent position to start things off with our sniper rifle. As I'm running around, I just imagine Grouse being like, What the hell is that lady doing? Eh, oh well. Well, oh well is, um, famous last choice of words there, pal. And now, I feel like that sign's in our way, like maybe the collision will block our shot or something, so gonna go ahead and pop one of those sweet stealth boys, and it's go time. Yes, I'm sure that we're no longer seeing Grouse feel safe. Well, he did. We for sure have the weaponry and the ability to take this place out because it's Craig Boone when you were able to take this place out. I don't know about easily, but effic somewhat efficiently, I'd like to think. And there's Richter. He does not belong in this world. Now, Paradise Falls is no Caesar's Legion, and not by a long shot. But these guys are still very well organized and very well armed. I like to think that our NCR trooper with her past and albeit limited, experience with the Legion, this is still somewhat cathartic. I also like to think that the average NCR Trooper would go through with doing this, because NCR Troopers, although they're not, uh, shall we say, up to par combat-wise, their morale's usually pretty low, but the troops on the ground still want to make the Mojave Wasteland a better place, and our NCR Trooper who deserted made her way to the Capital Wasteland is no exception, as DC, the Capital Wasteland area, is her new home. And I have to say, I have never seen that door drop before. That's why I was kind of confused and running around. I was like, wait, I can't get in. Oh, that's what the key's for. Okay, all right, let's do this. And we are going to start things off by targeting the nearest slaver, zooming in, taking it out, and then going back outside. What I'm hoping to do is lure a couple of them out here, but they don't seem to want to play ball. That's actually okay, because we can drop back down to caution, courtesy of our stealth boy. And just being out of combat for long enough as is. That allows us to regain the element of surprise. And the way to go through this place as we are. We're definitely going to be taking advantage of other areas. Like going into the clinic or elsewhere. Luring slavers inside and taking them out. Speaking of which, we're going to go ahead inside the clinic now. Because Cutter, the doctor here, is also hostile. So we're going to want to take her out. After we dispose of her, there is an inept slaver who comes and we take it out super easily. 
And of course, our buddy from Boone's Run, the guy with the minigun who zo who zones in. Sometimes we can target him, sometimes we can't. Now, I should have reloaded before heading outside to finish this dude off. I was kind of tunnel visioned. But still, it didn't end up punishing us too hard. And now, many of these slavers have an assault rifle, which you might argue is a weapon that totally suits an NCR trooper, and I do agree with that. It would be a perfect fit for them. Heck, and tell the two wastelands over in the Mojave Wasteland, sometimes the NCR troopers do have assault rifles. But unfortunately, it's not in our inventory. So outside of my 357 slash police pistol botch, not going to be using those weapons. And up next is a dude named Jutin? Jotin? Something like that. You gotta admire the balls on that guy. He sees someone with an assault carbine. He's like, yeah, the super sledge, it's gonna do the trick. I think he misinterpreted the whole don't bring a knife to a gunfight because, well, same logic applies to giant hammers there, buddy. And now before we head inside to Eulogy's pad, we're gonna go ahead and clean out the rest of the slavers here. There's that dude, Ymir, who also believes in the YOLO hammer life, and turned out great for him. And now, between this and Boone's Run, I always thought it was kind of funny that Clover, who is a slave with a pink dress, a slave collar, and a 12-gauge shotgun, is usually the hardest person to fight in here. She does have a unique cleaver, but not gonna bother with it this run because we can't use it. I'm guessing it's because she's a companion that maybe she has increased health or something. We may not have access to her as a companion, but taking her out does in fact level us up, which is pretty sweet. Once we go ahead and clear all that out and get move on, we're gonna go ahead and head inside of Eulogy's pad and have a throwdown with the big boss man himself. Now, as we went through this place, as you can see, we went through quite a bit of our 5mm ammo. And although we almost take out Eulogy Jones, we're gonna go ahead and switch to the 10mm submachine gun so we can finish him off. With how little health he had left, there was really nothing he could have done to us. And another reason to come to Paradise Falls, whether we're cleaning the place out, or if we just buy the kids off of Eulogy Jones so we can get a little lamplight, there is a bobblehead here, the Charisma bobblehead, and the Charisma bobblehead in Tell Two Wastelands is awesome. We're not required to get it in this run, but it's here, might as well get it, right? Now, we're gonna go ahead and advance in the main story just a little bit here, and Jefferson Memorial with our getup is pretty easy this time around. We're still a low enough level that Super Mutant Masters are very rare, and we don't fight any in here. The Brutes will take a bit more to take down, but still, nothing to write home about. And I figure, while we're here, might as well go ahead and grab the Hollow Tapes. That is, the, that is a clue that will lead us to where James is going. And of course, if you know where to go from the get-go, you can skip everything with Three Dog, Jefferson Memorial, the Trip to Rivet City, and just go there and get them. Something I think is really cool. And if I took that shortcut, it would cut the time of these challenge runs by quite a bit. Uh, but because I like doing the main story and changing things up a bit, and coming up with fun little scenarios for how the characters and, and the NCR Troopers unit's case, the unit, is here in the Capital Wasteland, I think it's a good way to spice things up a bit. I don't think the challenge runs would be very interesting if I took the same route every time. And yes, I did do that in Faction Warriors, but that's because the theme of Faction Warriors is to go fast and to take as little battles as possible to see how fast we beat the game. In Standard Challenges, I'm going to try and make things as interesting and diverse as possible. That's another reason why I thought that the idea of requiring us to get the tag skill-based bobbleheads would be more fun for the challenges. Because with having to get those bobbleheads, we're going to see new areas, and I'm not going to say no to bobbleheads in particular, because the bobbleheads just make us stronger. And the bobbleheads are adorable. And hey, speaking of bobbleheads, you'll notice that we're in Dunwich Building. We are here because this is where you get the melee weapons to bobblehead. It's a place that's infested with ghouls, and right now at our level, it's not too bad to deal with. You definitely don't want to put this place off for too long if you have the Broken Steel DLC. Because with the introduction of Broken Steel comes the Feral Ghoul Reavers. This place with Feral Ghoul Reavers is an absolute nightmare. And if this place in particular were me not using the flashlight really kind of comes into play here. When I play casually, typically I'll use Cat's Eye like once in a while, but without the use of the flashlight, I am using Cat's Eye quite often. But yeah, even with the glowing one that you have to fight here, this place isn't too bad. And Dunwich Building is one of my favorite areas in the entire game, so always cool to come here. Now, the melee weapons bobblehead and tail of two way sense is pretty interesting. You swing melee weapons 10% faster. That does stack with other perks. So, this and Super Slam is a pretty good time. 
And you know, while we're bobblehead hunting, might as well go ahead and track down that explosives bobblehead. And now before I enter the radio tower complex, I do hear someone, and it turns out to be a guy named Ben Cannon. We can give him some purified water, help him out a little bit. And I was gonna go back, but then I heard a raider off in the distance. You gotta say, that guy's pretty loud. The lungs on that boy, because I didn't see him on the compass at all. I'm looking around for him because I'm hearing him in the distance. And then as we get closer to the cliff, they start to appear on the compass. And it's just a game of whack-a-mole at this point. Raiders at this point in the challenge are very easy. Unless they happen to spawn with something like a missile launcher, which I haven't seen that yet. But you never know, it could happen. And I have to say, that turned out to be a real blessing in disguise because I did look up where the bobblehead was because I was like, well, the capital Y sign is huge. And even if I look it up, I still gotta track it down. And it turns out that there is a little tunnel you have to enter. Yeah, see, I glimpsed the wiki, so I was ready to enter that radio tower complex and scour it, but I didn't need to. Now, this was quite the little treat here, because not only do we have our explosives bobblehead, but there's a stealth boy here as well. Like I said earlier in the run, there are plenty of stealth boys you can find in preset locations throughout the Capital Wayside. I completely forgot about this one. The Tale of Two Wayside's version of the explosives bobblehead makes it to where our explosives have less spread. That's pretty neat. Now, there is one bobblehead I do want to get. We're not required to, but I'm like, you know what? I know the Endurance bobblehead's in Deathclaw Sanctuary, and it's close to the beginning. So, hey, why not? Let's try out our luck. And, uh, the way things start out is pretty funny. Like, right away as we go inside, because I don't have my flashlight, I can't quite see too well. So, I'm thinking that we have some higher ground. So, the first Deathclaw we see, I pull out the sniper rifle. I'm like, well, he's gonna have to run come up a ramp and well it turns out that ramp was right in front of me you can tell that i haven't been here in a really long time on that note we are going to switch to our assault carbine and i have to say taking a lot less damage than i thought we would take maybe i was wrong about the ncr trooper armor it is decent it's definitely the best armor we've had in any of our runs so far i gotta say our damage isn't too bad either i probably didn't need to use turbo but better safe than sorry and I could have done without that view, but hey, the immediate threat is dispatched, so let's go ahead and grab that Endurance Bobblehead and then get out of here. And for our level ups, typically I put points into our tagged skills. No need for speech in this run. I don't have to put our skill points into our tagged skills, but I thought it would be a little more interesting for this run. Now, fortunately for us, the Endurance Bobblehead is very close by, and we are about to hit Caution, so we want to grab this and then get the heffle out of here. The Endurance Bobblehead in Tale of Two Wastelands is pretty sweet. 5% damage resistance is pretty sweet. That does stack with stuff like toughness too, so very much worth getting. I am so glad this Bobblehead is at the start of this area rather than near the end. There's some pretty sweet loot in Deathclaw Sanctuary, but we can't use any of it, so time to skedaddle. In Tranquility Lane, we go ahead and do the failsafe. I feel like that's the option our character would take. And it's time to head back to Jefferson Memorial to take on the Enclave. One sniper rifle round isn't enough, but that's nothing a follow-up can't cure. And it's right around this point where I'm like, you know what, we have plenty of stealth boys. Might as well go ahead and use it before we take on the second Enclave goon. And gotta say, sniper rifle plus stealth boy is an awesome combination. Our NCR trooper may not be first recon, but our scope is the last thing that Enclave goon never saw. Now, we'll skip past all the dialogue with Colonel Autumn because it has no impact on the challenge. Taft Tunnels, though, we're not going to skip over. We'll take out the Feral Ghouls with our combat knife, save some ammo, and we're going to need it for our shootout with the Enclave Goons in a place where we can't reach with melee. Now, I could just run past these guys if I wanted to, but ever since our boon run, I've taken it upon myself to try and have a fun little shootout with these guys because it's usually this dynamic duo here, that results in the death in at least one of the scientists that accompany Madison Lee. We don't have to save them, but I like trying to. And the addition of an Enclave Hellfire Trooper here makes this a bit tougher, because as far as I know, they are bulkier than their standard Enclave Soldier counterparts. Not only was this shootout a lot of fun, but it wasn't too difficult. The perfect combination. So let's go ahead and cut straight to Murder Pass, as we do not have a 50 science skill. Now, as we go through here, just want to say that I have been showing the highlights, but I actually did a lot in this run. 
and I really wanted to show it. I did stuff like Canterbury Commons, um, Vance and the family with Moresti, Arafu, all that stuff. Uh, this particular challenge could have been the better part of two hours long with all the content I did. One of the things I struggle with, I mean, I say struggle loosely because for me, struggle for what I'm about to say is just me having fun trying to sort out what I want to add to these runs. It's me trying to juggle what I should put in these videos because, I mean, maybe there are some of you who wouldn't mind a two hour long video and I certainly wouldn't mind making one. But at the end of the day, I figure I'm going to be doing that stuff frequently throughout these runs. And I can always show off stuff like Canterbury or the Arafuma Resty questline in other videos. And the reason why I do bring that up is, I don't know if I've, if I've shown it or if you've seen it on screen, but sometimes I do use blood packs and I do have the buffed one you get from Vance's perk and that's really awesome in Tale of Two Wastelands, hardcore mode especially, because the upgraded one also replenishes 50 food and 50 H2O in addition to its normal effect. Pretty sweet. Murder Pass wasn't too difficult, but Vault 87 always has the potential to be dangerous. We are a high enough level to fight Super Mutant Masters now. And I mean, heck, we fought a couple in Germantown Police Headquarters, so there should be some in here as well. I am very curious, though, to see that if our varied arsenal will be able to carry us through this place, or will our mediocre armor finally catch up to us? Well, it's only one way to find out. And I figure, won't cut past the Rad Roaches this time. I mean, they're rad roaches. There's like four of them by that skeleton pile. Very easy to kill, especially with a melee weapon. However, I will say that that could not be... I'm not going to say dangerous, but it could be minorly troublesome because if we have to kill them with a loud weapon, we could alert the super mutants right up the stairs here. Speaking of which, although we're not sneaking, the first super mutant, very easy to take out with the assault carbine. You liking all of that ammo down there? I am. Uh, this just might be the most clutch Protector cast and has come in for us so far. And if you're curious, yes, he does also give you variations of ammo in Tale of Two Ways, since he'll give you armor-piercing rounds, hollow point rounds. It's a pretty good time. And hey, speaking of good times, the first Super Mutants we had to take out were extremely easy. As for that Super Mutant Master, almost goes down to one clip of our Assault Carbine, but hey, nothing we can't top off. I have to say, I'm pretty surprised that he took that much damage that fast. I mean, the Assault Carbine isn't a weapon I typically use. It's pretty good, but I usually use other stuff. That's another thing that makes these challenges pretty interesting. I have to use stuff that I normally don't. Like, I don't consider myself a good sniper either. But we've been making use of the sniper rifle and the hunting rifle as Boone. And gotta say, I feel like I'm getting a little bit better as each run goes on. And gotta say, real glad we got the jump on that Super Mutant Master there, because that automatic rifle he has, that's another New Vegas DLC weapon that sometimes these guys can spawn with. Very glad we took him out fast, because that could have gone real bad. Also, 308 ammo's nice. We'll make our way to what must be the most filthy safe room ever. I like resting up in there. Usually when I take breaks and stop for the day, it's in there if I'm at this point in the run. Oh, and you know how last run we stealthed by a good chunk of our enemies? <laughs> nah, not this time. I'm quite curious to see how we match up against not only this pair of super mutants, but the ones who are to come as well. And from the looks of it, we are tearing through them like a hot knife through butter. These are super mutant masters. They are some of the bulkier super mutant variants, so that's awesome. And another reason why I want to take out some super mutants is because we've had a fun little GRA challenge, which we get here. We end up getting a rank 1 of the Mutant Massacre perk. Not sure what that does, I'm guessing more damage to Super Mutants. That's pretty cool. I imagine that's a fair bit harder to get in Fallout New Vegas because there aren't many Super Mutants as far as I remember. Like, there's the, um, there's the Nightkin at Repcon, there's Utobatha, and of course there's Jamestown if you want to be a jerk and take out Marcus and the peaceful Super Mutants there. And gotta say, I am loving this feeling of dominance going through this place because I usually stealth by some super mutants at certain intervals. Haven't had to yet. I don't think we're gonna have to this time around. And just as we finish looting that safe and ammo box, bank the corner here. Let's not leave the centaur out of the fun. Super easy to kill, especially at this point. And a super mutant brute? Hey, why not? Join the club, my man. And we'll cut straight ahead to when we're going to the Gek. We grab Fox, like usual. However, this time around, we are clearly the stronger one here, doing a lot more damage. But we still gotta be a bit careful. The Super Mutant Masters are strong. 
At case in point, the Super Mutant Master we just took out also had an Assault Carbine. Now, in my previous runs, Nephi, Boon, and Raul, we had very limited inventory, so looting this place wasn't a problem. With everything at our disposal, and just how heavy our NCR Trooper armor is, we don't have too much that we can carry. It does sound silly, but inventory management with a variety of weapons we have at our disposal on top of how heavy our NCR Trooper armor is, that becomes a bit of a problem in this run. And by becomes a bit of a problem, I mean it's been a problem for most of it. I do welcome that little layer of challenge though, because our bottle cap count hasn't been quite as high as it's been in other runs. That means we can't just go ham at any vendor, and also was a pretty big reason why I decided to help out Protector Kasten in this run. Now, in case you are new here, I typically grab Fox because I like to throw him into the Purifier at the end of the game. Being that we're playing on Hardcore mode, if you enter the Purifier yourself, you die. Well, I can't say that's not lore-friendly. Now, if you thought us going in Guns Ablaze and was going to end here at Vault 87, well, we're going to try something a little different here at Raven Rock as well. Now, see, we do have the option to bribe this Enclave officer, but, you know, I kind of like my 500 bottle caps, and I've been, wanting to, I've been wanting to try to kill this guy for a while anyway. I actually haven't done this in quite a while. I forgot that he summons two extra guards, and they're not going to be too much of a problem for us either. Though their energy weapons are strong, so we will have to make use of cover through our former prison cell. And you just gotta love President Eden. We take out two of his soldiers, and then as we make our way to the main corridor, he's like, oh, wait, yeah, right. Hey, guys, don't shoot at our prisoner because I gotta talk to her. So if you don't shoot her, that'd be great. Thanks for that. But of course, after a certain point, Colonel Autumn will get on the intercom and override it because he knows what Eden's up to. Autumn knows why Eden wants to see us and takes matters into his own hands. Uh, normally, I stealth by these guys too because it is faster. But because we are pretty strong in this run, nah, we're gonna we're gonna go in guns of blazing. Also, experience points are nice. I just love the context of this situation. We have a deserting NCR trooper who ran away from the Legion. Can't say I blame her for that. And now she's here in the Capitol Wasteland, doing battle with the NCR's old enemy, the Enclave, by herself at Raven Rock. Talk about character growth, man. Give our dear lady a medal here once we're all said and done. The odds were against us, but our trooper emerges victorious, though this is far from the last of the Enclave soldiers. Now, because we are not under the effects of a stealth boy, we are going to have to fight a pair of Enclave soldiers before we can make our way to Colonel Lonham's office. I figure that ought to be a fun change of pace, and hey, we haven't used grenades in a while, so let's make use of those. I may have been a little zealous with my use of them, but hey, I'd rather overdo it and ensure that the Enclave goons are dead than underdo it and have some trouble. And it turns out that I did in fact waste a couple because I didn't expect the Enclave Soldier, the second one, to go up the stairs. Not really a problem for us, and I don't know why she reloaded so fast there. I didn't speed that up in editing, that was at normal speed. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is always someone's first video, and just in case they don't know, the Energy Weapons Bobblehead is in Colonel Autumn's office, which I always like to get just to show where it is in case someone's unfamiliar. It's also the only time throughout the course of the game you can get that bobblehead, so you always want to make sure to get it. In addition, Colonel Autumn has a little footlocker you can break into that has a unique hollow tape that has the self-destruct code for Eden's terminal. And yes, you do have to listen to it in order to get the code. You can't just have it on your inventory. You pop that bad boy into your pit boy, which we don't have. So for our NCR trooper, um, we're going to say that her emergency radio has been tweaked to her it can take hollow tapes. Now, as this character, we do not have any of the skill checks needed to talk Eden down and convince him to blow himself up, which is silly to just saying that is silly. I mean, yeah, we got the 22 speech check, but probably not going to pass that. And even if I did, I was able to pass it, I'd use the self-destruct code anyway, because it feels like the most authentic, organic way for this scenario to play out, at least in my opinion. Having activated the self-destruct sequence and taken the FEV vial, we can give that to Elder Lion so that he and his team can dispose of it once it's been analyzed. We're gonna make our way out of Raven Rock, and considering that we shot our way to President Eden, yeah, I think our way out's not gonna be too bad. Uh, before he blows himself up, Eden does assist us in our escape by programming the turrets and the robots to assist us on our way out. 
Now that's a real president right there, helping a civilian escape this dangerous premise. Yeah, he's got my vote. There isn't too much to write home about here. Getting out is pretty easy at this point. The Enclave soldiers, the basic ones, aren't too bad. Between our sniper rifle and our assault carbine, we have a pretty solid tag team for taking out these Enclave soldiers. And best of all, as we make our way out, we see our buddy Fox gunning down some Enclave goons, and we offer him to join us. Passing our karma check, Fox refers to us as a hero, which has got to be super awesome for our NCR trooper. All that's left to do now is get the Enclave out of Jefferson Memorial. Now again, if you're new here, this is your first video. Just know that I skip over Liberty Prime, because, yeah, the robot blowing up everything's pretty fun. Uh, but we can basically just follow him. There's no real, we don't have any real impact on that. So we're just gonna, we're gonna cut straight to Jefferson Memorial and have us a good old time. At this point, I've done my final supply run and it's time to head on over to Jefferson Memorial. Let's do this. We're not alone in our assault on Jefferson Memorial. At our side is Sarah Lyons and Fox. And because Sarah Lyons does follow you, she's mandatory to have for this part. I don't, I don't think having Fox here is really a big deal either. As you saw in Vol 87, we are the real damage dealer. At this point, Sarah Lyons and even Fox are more distraction than anything. And as we make our way through, what better time for us to use our armor-piercing rounds for our sniper rifle than right now? Power armor units and armor-piercing rounds? Yeah, it's like peanut butter and jelly. It wouldn't be like peanut butter and oil since they don't blend together at all. I don't know. You guys make up an analogy. I, I suck at that. <laughs> And yeah, I did accidentally hit Sarah Lyons with a bit of friendly fire. I saw the power armor, got a little trigger happy, but thankfully she's still alive and well. She is essential. She can't die here anyway, so not a big deal. And uh, this just might be the fastest we've gotten through Jefferson Memorial up to this point. The Enclave got absolutely decimated here. Now, as we make our way to Colonel Autumn, I decide to get a little cheeky and be like, hey, I'm going to try throwing some grenades to trigger the fight. Well, it turns out I missed all of them, or they were just far enough away to where they didn't hit any of the soldiers. Eh, that's fine. Yeah, I definitely missed Colonel Autumn there. So we'll go ahead and bust out our assault carbine and tear him to ribbons. Maybe you should have wore power armor instead of a trench coat to a firefight. But he's the Colonel, not me. And with the last of the Enclave goons gone, all we gotta do is activate the purifier and the challenge is over. Now, Fox isn't the only companion you can send into the Purifier. You can send in Sergeant RL3 and Charon if you get them. We didn't. I find Fox to be the most convenient one to send in because you get him along the way inside of Old 87. He's very easy to get. We have a chat with our big green friend. He agrees to activate the Purifier for us and yeah, challenge is over. I hope you guys enjoyed that run. Playing as an NCR trooper was pretty fun, I gotta say. And yeah, sorry about that little flub at, um, at National Guard Depot where I accidentally used a police pistol. I actually did think that was in my inventory. When I double-checked that after I cleared that area, took a break, I was like, oh, yeah, we have that, right? And I pulled it up, I was like, oh, no, we don't. Whoops. Well, I wasn't gonna reset the run because I had invested a few hours into the challenge at that point. I thought that was a funny flub and something I think is important to keep in as well because... Having an arsenal that varied for me was kind of hard to keep track of, so I, I misremembered. Well, I can tell you right now we will not have that problem with our next unit in Fallout New Vegas, as we attempt to go through Fallout New Vegas as a regulator. We did that in Faction Warriors as well, because our regulator won the units division. It gets its own full-fledged run. And I will see you guys back at the Mojave Wasteland. Later.